What's up guys, welcome back to the lab. I'm definitely Benny. Let's waste no time getting into today's topic, software architecture. Let's talk briefly about the definition of software architecture. I think the definition has two parts. The first part is, what are the major components of your program and how do they behave in relation to each other, right? Do two components compose each other? Or is there inheritance involved? Do they communicate with each other? And if so, how? A very big part of our project is laying out all those major components and start to talk about the behaviors between them. So that's piece number one of software architecture. Piece number two is taking that first part, what are the components and how do they behave? and aligning it with our acceptance criteria, which in the case of our application that we're building for the series is fast and easy communication, handling of non-contiguous gameplay, and intelligent decision-making for the artificial intelligence agents. So when we combine these two things together and we start looking at a high level, what our program is gonna look like, that is software architecture. It's important to examine the architecture of your software at least a little bit the very beginning of your project. The reason being is that when you look at the architecture and you look at the behaviors between different components in your project, it starts to help you make informed decisions about how you want to lay the whole project out. It starts to help you make informed decisions about infrastructure and how we actually want to deploy this product. Failing to take this step in examining the architecture of your program can lead to a lot more potholes down the road that you weren't prepared for and didn't anticipate. So now that we have all of that in mind of what software architecture is, if you want to have a little bit of a challenge, I challenge you to pause this video and take five minutes, 10 minutes, however long you need and come up with an architecture design pattern that you think will be good for this Dominion simulator that we are creating, right? Think about the different acceptance criteria that I just mentioned. Think about the different com major components that need to talk to each other. Come up with a solution and either put it in the comments down below or tweet me at definitely Benny on Twitter and send me your different design ideas and let me know what you guys think is a good architectural model for this program that we're about to dive into. And with all of that in mind now, let's take a look at the architecture that I'm proposing for the Dominion Simulator that we are creating as part of this series. So here we can see the different major components of the Dominion Simulator that we are creating as part of the series. At a high level, we can notice that there are three major components. We have the game, which consists of the game itself and the supply. We have the players, which are just clients. And then we also have a third piece, the messaging service. Now the messaging service doesn't seem very straightforward and doesn't really pop out when you think of the game being played in person. But this is because of how we're going to be able to handle the non-contiguous gameplay elements as well as the easy and fast communication between players and each other or between the players in the game or the game of the players. For now, we're going to just simply talk about the one in front of us here today, which I deem the polling method. Now, there are a lot of pros and cons to this method. I'm going to start with the cons first. So one of the first cons that we notice here is polling is not the greatest communication method between two products. Polling is extremely CPU intensive, can cause a lot of issues in terms of load. It can freeze up different APIs depending on which APIs you're using and their ability to handle thousands of, of requests per second or per minute. There is a possibility of more communication being necessary than if the game could just call methods on the players immediately. And some of the more easy interactions such as a player buying a car become a little bit more complex when we move to the polling method because the players don't have immediate direct access to things like the supply and the trash. Now those are some pretty significant cons. However, as with almost anything in software engineering, if we can prove that the pros outweigh the cons, then it doesn't matter. So let's talk about the pros for a little bit. To me, the pros for this architectural model are that there is a loose coupling between the game and the players. And a lot of the other models that I've created, there was a very tight coupling between the game and the supply and the players. A lot of times, the game called methods on the players, the players called methods on the supply, and everything ended up having a reference to everything else, right? The game had a list of players and had a supply. Whenever the players would take their turn, we would pass in an instance of the supply. Uh, we would pass in instances of other players because they needed to know about the other players, so on and so forth. It was very tightly coupled. In this model that we're proposing, everything's very loose. The only thing that we need to know about the other players or the game itself is what messages they can interpret when we put them on the messaging service. 
and the messaging service doesn't need to know anything about these messages. It's going to have an endpoint to add a message and an endpoint to listen. And that's about it. It doesn't need to know anything else because it's just acting as a proxy for those messages to get to where they need to go. The second big pro, in my opinion, is that this can handle non-contiguous gameplay. So let's run through a couple quick scenarios of how different turns could play out. So in our first scenario, we're gonna assume that this player here who's about to take their turn does not have any actions. Now this is common in a game of Dominion. This is usually the first two turns. Player one is currently listening to the messaging service waiting for a message to come with their name on it. The game tells player one to start their turn. Player one picks up on that message, has no actions to play. So what do they do? Well, they immediately play their coins and their treasures that they can play and send a message back saying, hey, I have four coins and I wanna buy a card, right? The game can then return back a message and put another message onto the messaging service saying, these are the cards you can buy. The player picks one and it's done, easy. We didn't have to worry about a player not having actions because we can just move into the next phase on the player object itself. So in our last scenario here, we're gonna talk about a very interesting interaction. The interaction I'm talking about is a card called Masquerade. If you pull this shit in no words, it's just hands. Now, Masquerade is a very interesting card in that it's one of the only, or one of the very few cards in Dominion that actually allows players to pass cards in between each other. But with Masquerade being played, every player that has cards in their hand passes a card to the next player in line. In this current architectural model we're looking at right now, we don't actually have to have that. The player who's playing the card can simply say, hey, I'm playing Masquerade, and I know the player that's after me. So the player can put a message on there saying, hey everyone, I'm playing Masquerade. So any players who have cards in hand can also put a message onto the messaging service saying, hey, here's the card for the next player after me, which is player so-and-so. Each player does that, and then the last player would circle back around and that card would be passed to the player who started this whole thing and then they can choose how to handle it from there, right? So we have two different things that are going on here simultaneously. The first thing is non-contiguous gameplay. The second thing is asynchronous communication. The polling method, while being slow compared to other methods that we've tried in the past, is still gonna be faster, one, than regular people playing it, and two, faster than most other methods that we can try. And lastly, ultimately, the players are now completely decoupled from the game and only get the information that they need when they need it, so this is the architectural style that I'm planning on moving forward with as we start to implement the Dominion Simulator in this series. We've taken the better approach of looking at it ahead of time, looking at our major components, breaking it down and seeing how they're gonna work with each other. We've started to anticipate these potholes and we're ready for them and ready to handle them in a manner that's gonna be consistent with the architecture we're trying to build. It's also gonna be consistent with handling and meeting the acceptance criteria that we've been given. In the next video, we're gonna talk about planning, what it means to plan, handling functional decomposition of larger pieces of your project into bite-sized pieces that we can handle easier. We're gonna talk about Agile versus Waterfall versus Scrum. We're not gonna say which one's the best, but we are gonna talk about them. And finally, we're gonna talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is the walking skeleton, or at least we're gonna introduce it. I hope to see you guys there. We'll catch you next time.